All right. John and I just sat down and broke down how we would take a beginner to their first 10 second handstand. I might be biased, but the conversation was amazing. We talk skills, drills, mobility, crab fishing. It's an emotional roller coaster. Episode eight, handstands. Actually, we'll be interviewing as a team. You are the best movers on the planet. So, bro, what kind of muscles you have? No. Bro, what kind of patterns you have? We're here to fuck shit up. All right, we confirmed it. Episode eight. Yeah. Whoa, what just happened? I've never heard that before, but it, have I. Siri crazy. just told us recording in progress, so we must be recording. All right, yeah, well, now we've confirmed we're recording. All right. Movement Athlete Podcast, Episode 8. I'm Dr. Wes Hendricks. And I'm John Lindsay. John, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about how to get started with the handstand. Uh, what, are the, what are the drills you need to hit? What are maybe some prerequisites uh, to hit with certain drills before you advance to the next progression of a drill? All that good stuff. Um, I think both of us had have done the handstand kind of journey early on. So we should be pretty insightful on this. Um, and I can go ahead and say, I learned kind of the hard way with handstands. I was, I this, yeah. my yeah. goal was go to the park, kind of just screw around for 30, 40 minutes, just kicking up, trying to find balance and see if I could get it after about two years of that. I, I could, I mean, I could probably hold a handstand in place for 15 to 20 seconds, but it was, banana back, uh, not a consistent 15 to 20 seconds. I could walk around no problem, but my ability to hold that straight line handstand for more than two, three seconds was non-existent. So luckily Wes put me on the the right path after that and, and I wised up. Um, did you ever, did you ever I think, like, I think, I didn't mean to go ahead. There. No, was, no, go ahead. That was awkward. Um, did you ever like YouTube had a handstand? Did you ever look into it or were you just like, I'm going to kick up and keep trying? I probably did at some point, but I was probably whatever I found. I was probably good enough at like walking on my hands that if I saw like, oh, just go chest to wall, I was probably like, oh, I don't need that. I got this. So, <laughs> um, and at that point, there wasn't like, there probably was, I'm sure there was good information out there. I just didn't know how to come about it yet. So, yeah. I mean, uh, working with you, the phase one stuff was my first like, oh okay moment like this is a lot more work than i thought okay i'm not just kicking up and eventually i'm going to get lucky and somehow ingrain this uh ingrain this pattern i'm going to get it like a lot of people say yeah i've almost got a handstand and i'm like what does that mean yeah, well, like you kicked up a couple of times and you almost held it for like more than two seconds so that's kind of where i was i was I thought I was better than I was. So it was nice to have a reality check and see what real programming looked like. That's funny that you said that. I almost have a handstand. What does, what does that even mean? Um, before we dive into it, there's, I just had this thought. Did you end up catching, did you, uh, did you get crabs and cook those? What, what, what happened this weekend? I only caught one, so I threw it back. Um, but that's better. The last time I went, I, I went by myself and I, I pulled the crab net up at a weird angle because I was on my paddleboard and they all dumped. I had at least three in there and they dumped out. So I've now successfully caught one. So the next time I go, I'm assuming we'll catch enough to be able to actually eat. So what were you, uh, what we, was in there? Like, what did you what was put it? The, the bait? Yeah. Chicken legs. Okay. Chicken legs. I was wondering what that was yeah. when I saw it. It was, Hey, you're, you're on your way to being a, a successful crabber having crabs. I know. I'm going to be totally sustainable living here, <laughs> catching my food. <laughs> You're on your way. Um, all right, ba back to the handstand here. Um, so I think the first thing we need to talk about or think about it, um, a lot of people think of it as a skill, and yes, it is a skill, but it's a skill when you're good at it and, you know, you can refine it. At first, at first it's way more of a strength um, because, like, think about how taxing a handstand was for us when we first started. Like, chest wall handstands, like you had to psych yourself up for like a, you know, 15, 20, 30 second hold. When we were, you know, pushing those 60 second holds, those were like max effort work. That was for us at the time, real strength work. So it, at first it needs to be approached and programmed, um, in my opinion, as strength work. Um, so it needs to be addressed that way. You know, it's, it needs to be taken as seriously as deadlift work, squat work, 
um, whatever your other priorities are. You know, it's not, at first it's not a skill, you know, it's not something that I can do for 10 minutes or practice and kicking up at the park like you kind of talked about. You know, maybe some people are going to get it, some really athletic people, but I think more people would have handstands if that approach worked. Um, that's just kind of my take on it. Um, so I think it needs to be addressed as a serious skill. Yeah, and so you, I like what you said about the strength work. So with that, I think you really need to think about resting between sets too. I think a lot of people, and I made this mistake early on, if I'm doing three to five sets of trying to go – maybe 30 to 60 seconds on the wall, chest to wall. I was probably resting like five minutes in between sets. Like it's, you got to let the body recover. You got to kind of mentally recover too and be ready to uh, give the best quality effort you can on there. So don't be afraid to rest longer in between those sets, just like you would between uh, like, like a hard five by five squat se session where you're nearing max effort every single set. Um, that's the sort of mindset with the rest you have to take as well. So I know the first thing we always talk about, um, and we'll get into the specifics here on different beginner drills, wrist mobility, wrist strength, um, kind of the, the first couple of drills. And a lot of the stuff's going to be um, repetitive. We've talked about it before here, but you know, repetition is the key to actually get this stuff down. Um, the first thing people always get hung up with is the line. You know, like I want my line to be stacked. I want my line to be straight. Like, yeah, yes, we want it to look pretty because you know, it's probably going to get more likes on Instagram. Um, but if you don't have the balance, the line is going to happen. But that doesn't mean you can't be working towards a more efficient line by opening up your shoulders, whether it's your T-spine, your shoulder flexion, your lats, um, you know, external rotation, whatever your limiting factors are. So before we get into the specific handstand stuff, let's talk about uh, different mobility work to open up that line. So once the balance is there, um, people can kind of set themselves up for success and they aren't limited by their mobility. Um, so where do you like to start with mobility work for opening up the shoulders for handstands? Um, if someone has a tight, and a lot of people do a tight T-spine, I like doing a dynamic lat tri stretch. So I'm sure a lot of people listening to this know what a lat tri stretch is, but for those that don't, essentially putting your elbows up on a, a weight bench, you can be on your knees to start and your pinkies are facing one another so you've really got this externally rotated shoulder position um, and then from there you're just dropping the sternum down you're getting this you're kind of forcing this extension through the thoracic spine and you're also forcing uh, some nice shoulder flexion as well I like doing that with a nice slow tempo pausing briefly in the bottom uh, maybe doing five to ten reps and on the last one holding for five ish seconds uh, I think that's a great way to prep the spine and, and some shoulder flexion as well for uh for prior to going up on, on the wall uh, to help with that overhead position. So when you're setting up that lat tri stretch, because you had, you talked about the pinkies facing each other to promote that external rotation. Um, are you holding on to like a, a stick or something or a PVC pipe? Um, you could, I traditionally don't, but I know that does help kind of lock in that position. Mm -hmm. um, or like a dumbbell behind the head. I've seen that. Yeah, you could do that as well. Um, and that would help with that plus gravity would force a little bit more of the extent extension through the spine. So uh, both would be great tools to add. Okay. And you're doing those for reps as opposed to like uh, static holds? You could do holds. I like... I like both. I like reps just because I think with each rep, you might sink a little deeper and then you can add a little hold at the end, uh, anywhere from five, 10, maybe 15 seconds. Okay. Now, is there any cue that you like to use that you've found? Cause I, I've, I've found people are, um, people are, what, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, the first few words that come to mind, I don't want to say, uh, I'm just going to call people stupid. Like they think they're moving their T spine and they're really moving their lumbar spine. You know, they're just kind of twerking, or like doing a, it's kind of like when you watch idiots do like a, a cat cow for their T-spine, they're just moving their lumbar spine or their butt. Um, how do you prevent that lumbar spine from moving? How do you kind of lock it into place so you best set people up for success with moving their T-spine? So the knee variation, I think, is a little easier because it's okay. not nearly the load if you're on your feet. But I like just telling someone, hey, think about the sternum, drive that sternum down. And, you know, after a couple reps, if you're not feeling your spine extensors in the mid back upper back working you're probably not doing it correctly because if you don't have great thoracic spine extension and you're working in a t-spine extended position you should feel that upper back working at some point 
uh, pretty early on. So if you're not feeling it, videotape yourself, check out your form and see where you're making a mistake. Um, and think about the sternum driving down. The sternum is right there in, in the front of the thoracic spine. So if you're thinking about driving that down more often than not, you're probably going to be working the T-spine. All right, guys. And if you don't know what a sternum is, you're A, stupid, and B, just Google it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so in my experience doing these, um, like even after we went to, um, one of Ido's courses where we covered this, I remember my T-spine being sore the next day when, uh, we worked just more, like the amount of work we did on it was in your experience, does your T-spine get sore from it? For sure. Yeah. But it's in a good way. It's like, yeah. you've, uh, you've just worked an area that hasn't been worked in a while. Um, and you might be standing up a little taller the next day. Like it's clear you've worked something that needed to be worked. Now, would you say this is kind of like the, uh, the one legged good morning where it's like, we can take it really far and we don't need a ton of exercise variation for that T spine. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I like that a lot. Um, I mean, especially if we're talking about just the handstand here, like getting enough thoracic spine extension for a straight handstand. Mm -hmm. That's not like you're excessively extending the, thoracic spine you just need enough to get a straight line so um yeah just working that drill can definitely take someone who doesn't have the straight line it can assist really well in getting the straight line okay so I, I like that one too and honestly like i don't think we need like people get hung up on all these different exercise variations but to be honest um mm -hmm. that lat tri stretch has gotten a lot of people really far with their mobility so I would be hesitant to start giving out people multiple variations just for um, um, trying to avoid sake. boredom. Yeah, like yeah, just for the sake of it. Yeah, just for the sake of it. You know, like I'm not looking for constantly varied mobility work here. Like, get fucking good at doing the the lat tri step stretch. Really take the time, do the work. Um, all right, so we hit the T spine there. Um, in terms of shoulder flexion, is there? You know, so I'm going to bounce between direction and muscles here. So is there a specific muscle that you like to maybe address for shoulder flexion that you find most limited? Um, I don't know if there's a muscle specifically. I do like, uh, I mean, hitting the upper trap, also hitting the external rotators of the rotator okay. cuff, I think are huge. If I'm thinking of one group in particular, I don't know what would be the the constant kind of red flag I see on people. It's probably a combination of the two, but uh, I love front body lines. If you're just trying to work pure shoulder flexion. So mm -hmm. really hammering that mid upper trap or mid mid trap area. Um, yeah. What about you? What do you, what do you see as the biggest red flag? Is it just, so maybe I wouldn't say red flag, but just in general, you know, and this is going back to like, you've taken like FMS and SFMA. Have you, have you taken those courses? I'm very familiar with them, but, and I worked in a college, collegiate gym that utilized them. I've never been to the, I've performed the testing multiple times, okay, but I've yeah, never, yeah. never I, been I knew, to seminars or anything. I feel like you've done them before. So the one that, um, uh, they, that I got a lot from them and just working in clinical practice for a while was working at lat, looking at lat mobility and that was just also with CrossFitters too, you know, overhead position, whether it's for Olympic lifting or not. And, the, you know, the, the top of a, a clean and jerk, you know, holding that barbell overhead. If you're not um, overextending your, your uh, lumbar spine, you know, it's, there's going to be some lats involved. And I think a lot of people that are um, coming into this, they've gotten away with training through, you know, reduced range of motion or limited range of motion. So they definitely could use uh, some lat mobility. Um, and I think it was probably inspired from even looking at it from where I was talking about previously with the FMS or SFMA. Um, so lat mobility is one. And honestly, I don't have, you know, I have a what few is, different, I have a few different lat ones. What's their test for lat mobility? I don't remember. Um, so I don't even know if it's up to, like, it, I'm sure they've updated this. Cause like this was we're we're, we're going now. This was probably almost 10 years ago. Yeah, probably 10 My years ago. My last experience with it. From, from when I went to it. Um, but, you know, they had different ones where you'd lay uh, supine on the floor. You know, you'd bring your arms behind your head. And I'm doing this demo okay. to John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we don't video this yet. Um, you know, and can you keep your spine flat on the floor? Um, and I may even be butchering it. I may be mi mixing that up with another continuing ed I went to. 
No, that uh, sounds familiar. Yeah, and then it's just like, do, are you extending in the lumbar spine or your TL junction, or do you actually have that shoulder flexion? And it'd be the same thing if you like sat, um, you're not supposed to say, I think Indian style, like crisscross applesauce, you know? If you sat with your legs crossed back against the wall, same thing, you raise your arms up overhead. Can you get your hands to the wall? Are you overextending your spine? Uh, so going back to that lats, I think lats is a big one, but what, do you have any good lat mobility drills? What do you like for that? Cause I'm sure you need that for the bridge too. Um, I mean, if someone's not accustomed to just hanging passively from a bar, I would definitely put that within a program somewhere and maybe encourage it on a daily basis. Like that can take someone super, super far, uh, a step further than that. If we're working, we're thinking about lat mobility plus shoulder flexion. Um, I really like shoulder flex, what I would call loaded shoulder flexion lifts where you're mm -hmm. Your back is supported by a bench and then you're holding some amount of weights on a bar, not a, not a ton, maybe 10 to 20 pounds, or it could just be one single dumbbell. And with arms totally straight, you're just lowering that back over behind you, keeping your upper body locked into a straight line there. You're letting gravity sink that weight down um, as low as it can, pausing briefly in your end range, very strictly bringing it back up. Um, so a nice controlled tempo both ways. That's a great drill to help, uh, not lengthen the lats and, and get much more shoulder flexion. Okay. So I, I think we definitely covered the mobility aspect right there in and of itself. T-spine mobility and shoulder flexion, um, whether it's the lats limiting you or another aspect of that shoulder flexion limiting you, um, we're definitely hitting some good points there. And I don't think we, we need to overwhelm people with a lot of different exercises. I think if you do those two, you're going to get pretty freaking far with your overhead mobility to the point where – where your line's gonna be pretty good. Um, maybe not ninja status, but we're, we're getting up there. Um, so I'm happy with that. Let, let's move on to the, um, some of the, the finer, what we could call, and what you started to get in there with the body line drills. The, what do we wanna call it? What'd be a cool sounding word? <sighs> Movement pattern, that's really boring. Maybe motor programming, that sounds really cool, right? Motor yeah. programming the, the movement. Um, and you touched on the body lines and I think that body lines is honestly, it's the most boring movement, um, when somebody wants to start a handstand, but I can't tell you how necessary it is. Yeah. And if you really want the handstand and you think the front and back body line drills are super boring, well, every time you do them, get as much out of them and take them as serious as you can. Cause the more you do that, the less time you have to spend on them in the future. Um, if you kind of half ass them and don't pay attention to, all the fine details of it, uh, you're going to be doing it longer. Like that's just, that's just how it is. So um, if you want a handstand, take those two drills super seriously and you'll get the handstand faster. Yeah. The, especially the front body line, that front body line is going to teach you how to coordinate the, we could call it order of operations while being upside down, but you're on the floor. So you're in a lower threshold environment. So you can actually pr practice the cues, um, where you don't have to worry about the balance. Cause the second you start, if you don't have, you know, if you can, like you said earlier, kind of do a handstand, um, the second you kick up every single one of those cues go out the freaking window. And all you're trying to do is just balance however you can, you know, you're gripping the floor, squeezing your, you're, you're just holding your breath. You know, you're doing whatever you can to stay upside down for as long as you can. So those body line drills are going to definitely help you, you know, with that shoulder elevation, um, working on opening up the chest, working on how your pelvis is situated in relation to the shoulders. Um, you know, I can't stress it enough on how important it is. And I like how you said, you know, get the most out of it because you're going to have to at some point in time. And I find myself still revisiting it when I want to work on my line more. Or if I think my line is lacking for that day, I'll go and do some body line drills and then go back to my handstand work. Nice. All right, so we got the body line drills. Um, where do we want to take it next? Do we actually want to get upside down? So, well, I think before we do that, we should definitely talk about the wrist. Uh, okay. Because especially if you're if you're someone who's new to handstands, yeah, maybe you've spent time doing some push up work, some stuff where your hands are playing on the ground, but your wrists need to be prepped. I mean, there's I do some sort of a warm up for my wrist before any sort of handstand session now, regardless how long it is. And in the beginning, it's totally 
absolutely necessary to spend a good, I'd say five minutes minimum yeah. of various just wrist extension work um, and wrist and a lot wrist flexion work too, just to really make sure those wrists are, they're strong, they're mobile, they're pliable, they're, they're everything. Um, because if the wrist breaks down, you're not going to be spending much time on your hands and your progress is going to be super minimal. So yeah. Um, what are some wrist drills you, you, you like? I know there's plenty out there. Yeah. And honestly, guys, even I, I don't know why you'd be listening to this podcast if you don't want a handstand, but maybe you just maybe you're thinking I'm going to say something really offensive or people just like listening to John. So you're listening to see what we're going to say. Um, yeah. If you don't they, want to, they already heard about how the they already heard about how the crabs turned out, so they <laughs> turned it off. <laughs> well, if you're still listening, um, the wrist routine honestly is extremely valuable, even if you have no interest in a handstand. If you're going to take one thing from it, the the amount of stuff we do with our hands and how much we neglect our our wrist mobility is kind of mind boggling. The wrist routine, I think my wrist routine video on YouTube might have the most views. Um, just, nice. just from how, um, beneficial it is to such a, cause it just doesn't apply to handstands. You know, it's so applicable to somebody that doesn't even want to get off their ass and work out. You know, you're still on your phone all day. You're still at a computer working. Um, you can definitely keep your wrists healthy. Um, yeah. in, ter in terms of, um, what we can do, um, how do we even describe these? Cause most of them don't even have like cool names for just the wrist mobility drills. Do they? No, but I would say the easiest thing is you mentioned it. Just go to Wes's YouTube page and find that wrist routine. Uh, yeah. I'll have to make it a we, we, yeah, we could sit here and describe them, but I mean, essentially, you're just positioning your hand in various ways and you're leveraging your body to make uh, to kind of warm up the wrist to work it in extension, work it in flexion, and just make sure it's it's mobile and can handle some amount of load under different positions. So uh, let's not get too technical with it. Let's just go check out Wes's page. Um, cause you're going to want to see it anyways. You're going to want to know the fine details of how you lean forward, how you apply more load, how you reduce load, all that good stuff. So spend five minutes, uh, your forearms should feel nice and pumped. Your wrists should feel much more looser and ready to go. Uh, so now that we've got the wrists warmed up, we've done some, what is it? Movement prep. What is it? Movement prep. What, oh, we came up with a fancy, we uh, a fancy uh, term. Motor programming. Uh, motor pro. Uh, when when we start selling a, a seminar, we'll have cooler names. We'll throw the word functional in there somewhere. Um, yeah. Movement. Um, other buzzwords. Um, we'll we'll get back to you guys on this. Yeah. So uh, we've hit. <laughs> well, we've hit two troublesome areas. We've hit a little T spine. We've hit a little shoulder flexion. And then, and then we work two drills that kind of mimic what the handstand looks like, but we're yeah. doing it in an, in an easier position, the front and back body line. Mm -hmm. We've warmed the wrist up. Now we're ready to get upside down. Yeah. And honestly, I don't, I don't include, and I think I've talked about this in other podcasts. I don't include this as wrist mobility work, but first knuckle raises, um, first knuckle raises, think of yourself in a push up position. Um, and you're just literally lifting the heel of your hand off the floor. Um, that's the best way to describe it. Most people listening to this podcast hopefully have seen it. Um, and you're just raising almost up onto your fingertips and back down. Um, and the value in that, other than strengthening your forearms, it, it strengthens your, your fingertips, your hands, your forearms to the point that if you can lift yourself up in the top of a push-up position, you should have some pretty good forearm strength so when you're beginning to kick up into that handstand and let's say your feet start to go over your hands kind of into that banana position or that position everyone's afraid of, of flipping over and quote unquote dying. Um, I don't know what the statistics on, on death rates are for flipping out of a handstand. Um, but Somebody, somebody's died for sure. Uh, <laughs> someone somewhere, but I can't tell you when I have people start kicking up, you know, they, they tell me they're afraid of dying. Um, no, none of my clients knock on wood have, um, there's been no fatalities yet, but anyway, that first knuckle raise is going to strengthen your forearm. So when your feet start going over your hands, you can catch yourself and you have better command or better control of your body. Um, so somebody keep in mind and probably John and I will post all these videos too throughout the week. It gives us material to, to go off of here. Um, but I think we want to start getting upside down at some capacity and doing 
some sort of strength holds, whether they're piked handstand holds uh, or chest to wall handstand holds. Um, the, the thing I find with a lot of my athletes when they come on board, um, they've been training handstands at some, some capacity, whether they've been doing chest to wall holds, you know, or they've been trying to kick up and do what you said of just trying it. Um, probably 70% of the time I'm going to regress people back to pike handstand holds because they've just, they've developed a lot of bad habits in the chest wall handstand hold. So I want to clean it up in a pike handstand hold where we're just bearing less load on the joints. So it, it develop better habits before we start progressing the movement. Cool. What, a, so what uh, milestone would you want someone to hit on that uh, on a consistent basis before you said, all right, let's go back to the chest wall. So for me, I, I really, I want to see a good line of the wrist, elbows, shoulders, um, and hips stack all di directly over each other in that pike handstand hold. Um, typically the, the feet are going to be relatively high. So maybe the, the, uh, the lower body and the upper body are forming like an L position. Um, and we can, you can also see that they're pushing away from the floor, elevating the shoulders into the ear. So they're really doing a good job of, you know, utilizing their traps to open up that line. Um, and they're able to hold it for, you know, 30, 45 seconds. So then we can get back on the wall and we can get relatively close to the wall too. Cause inevitably what happens is when people start to climb up into the wall for that chest wall handstand, they're not ab able to open their shoulders up enough in that position. So they end up bearing most of the load in their lumbar spine. And it looks kind of like a, something more like a, along the lines of like an incline bench press. So we're, we're mm -hmm. just not going to have any transfer over to that handstand um, or not. It's not going to be efficiently training the chest wall the way we want to. Um, because while we say with the, with the handstand, when you kick up, it's okay with freestanding if the line isn't perfect at first, because there's so many different factors coming into play. The chest wall handstand should more or less, I don't want to say look perfect, but it shouldn't look by any means banana, you know, cause you have the wall there measuring or setting yeah. you up for a good position. Um, so if you're not able to get a, a decent line against the wall, um, something's limiting you in strength and mobility. Um, it's not the balance component in the freestanding. So that's why I like to back off into that pike so we can regress it and we can work at a, a load that's more manageable. And you, people should really think about it no different than, you know, if you're going to deadlift, you know, if you want to train strength, you know, strength is trained at, I don't know what the numbers are, 65 to 80% of your 1RM, I'm just guessing. Um, but, you know, you're going to train at a certain percentage. But with these body weight movements, um, it's a little harder sometimes to regress or scale back the percentage. Um, so with the chest to wall handstand, my way of scaling or regressing it back is a pike to wall handstand. It's definitely, um, it's not that exciting for people at first too, you know, but it's kind of the reality of the situation. I think, um, you know, quality over quantity. I know it's a cliche. Um, so that's where I like to start with most people. Cool. I like that. Yeah. And you can never reinforce solid form enough. So never be uh, on any movement we're going to talk about. If you feel like you're second guessing yourself, you probably need to scale back. So, I mean, do a video of whatever the drill is, check it out and be honest with yourself and regress if you need to regress and hold something longer than struggle through something and, and not get as much out of it. Yeah. So and that, that chest to wall can take you super far too. Um, cause it's just building that strength and that capacity to be upside down. The longer you can hold it, the, the more strength, the more mobility you have, um, the more awareness you're going to develop of what you're doing with your shoulders, what you're doing with your pelvis. Um, and obviously film it too. So you can see what cues are actually resonating and working for you. Um, and John and I took it to the extreme of five, six sets of 60 seconds. I think we did it that like five times a week for like yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be pissed at myself if I had to miss a day too for like something beyond my control, like work or traveling. I was like, ah, <laughs> so, and it's funny because you, because you know, 30 seconds have gone by and then you look at the clock and it's only been five seconds and you're like, shit, set a, set a timer and throw it away. Right. As you <laughs> climb onto the wall, you don't want to look at it. Oh, it's terrible. It goes, those 60 seconds go so slow. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're definitely develop, developing some solid capacity building up to multiple sets. You know, 
whether 60 seconds is too extreme, you, you got to be very comfortable at sets of 30 seconds on those chest wall, in my opinion. Yeah, one thing that helped me out early on was, and I think the main reason I did this was because I was coming from a sloppy handstand, but and it helped, it helped the time go by faster too. When I was holding them, I would say, press through the ground, elbow locked, shoulders elevated, uh, abs tight, butt tight, legs pressed together. Like I would just say all these cues over and over during the entire hold, uh, sometimes out loud, sometimes just in my head. And that stuff totally works. Uh, the same on the body line drills. If you just repetitively say what you need to do within the drill in your head, it's going to be reinforced more and more. So, And I think it does make the time go by faster. So if you're getting bored and antsy, just uh, check, run through a self-check throughout the entire hold. It makes it go by quicker. I like that. Would we call that a mantra? Is that what that would be? Is it a mantra? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like that. I, I don't remember what the hell I did. I probably had a music or a podcast going on in the background. Um, yeah. But honestly, so those just the walls, you can go really far. And then there's probably just two other drills I like, honestly, other than the, uh, like, it, it, there aren't a lot of movements you need to be doing. The only other two that I like to use are um, split kickups to start. And split kickups, all they're doing is training the entry into the handstand. Um, because when we look at the handstand for a beginner, you have, you have the entry into the handstand and then you have the actual balance itself. Um, and I think a lot of people make the split mistake, like John already talked about, of trying to train them both at the same time. It just doesn't work, you know, because it's, you, there's so many qualities going on at once of, you know, the balance, the, uh, the strength of being in that position, the mobility requirements. Um, you want to break it up into its individual pieces as much as you can to kind of set yourself up for success when training it. So just training the entry into it is what I like to do in the form of split kickups. So that, that would literally be, you know, maybe you're two feet away from a wall because I always start with a wall and you kick up and you have one foot go in front of you. The other foot goes behind you like a split or kind of like you've scissored, you've scissored your legs here. And all that's doing is creating a wide base of support so you have a better chance to balance because when you kick up and immediately close your legs together, it's kind of like jumping and trying to land on a very small balance beam as opposed to jumping and trying to land on a, a giant box, you know? So the, the wider base of support is just going to lend itself to more balance and doing it with the wall there, your foot's going to go into the wall when you tip over. So less fatalities like we've already covered. Um, so I just honestly start with that. And I start pretty, pretty early on, kind of like you talked about with your bridge work, um, that you just kind of give it to people at the end. Like you give them some bridge walks to make them feel better about themselves more or less. Um, I, I give people split kickups just, just to start practicing kicking up, you know, and a lot of times they'll get these one, two, three second floats. Um, and it's definitely exciting. And it, it just allows them to start getting comfortable kicking into the handstand. Yeah, no doubt. And it's, uh, I mean, that is the gateway from the wall to the freestanding is slowly drifting off the wall and hanging out for a bit. Uh, and over time you're getting three seconds becomes five, five becomes yeah. eight seconds. And then all of a sudden you're comfortable getting sets of, or a couple reps of maybe five to 10 seconds within the same, within the same set there. So uh, I love that drill. I think that's the best. I know I'm curious what your next drill is, but I know, I think I see more success with that drill than with heel pulls, which I think is a traditional yeah. one. A lot of people mm -hmm. do. I find heel pulls to be pretty technical and a more, much more advanced drill than, uh, than the split kickups. So yeah, the heel um, pull, I think reinforces a better line. And I think people way early on, it's just really hard to grasp that perfect line and like to push through the shoulders, um, yeah. you know, and be that stacked. It's just, it's not happening at first. And I, and I remember programming for a lot of people earlier on with heel pulls and it just, you know, it was, I was kind of begging in my head cause I was like, why aren't these people getting it? Like, I just want you to push through the floor, you idiots. Yeah. Um, and I, well, and that's I, the subtleness you have to push to just yeah. barely drift off and not fall back over is so, Oh yeah. It's, it's showcasing a lot of control there. And I, they did help me out, but I'm just, 
so stubborn and I probably worked on those for two months before I really five days a week before I really was <laughs> like all right I got these so they can be the split kickups to me are a much more applicable early on drill no doubt yeah and th then once once you're at the point two where you know you're no longer slamming into the wall because that, that's honestly I, I use as a, as a gauge with a lot of my clients you know because when you first kick up you're just trying to get your feet over your hands so you're going to kick up kind of hard. And a lot of times people's feet slam into the wall. And then eventually over time, what happens is they start going up and they're barely tapping the wall. You know, they're barely making contact. Um, it's like a super light touch. So eventually I'll, I'll move them away from the wall and get them comfortable in the middle of the floor, just kicking up into that split position. And I, I really think it's a great tool to have in your toolbox anyway, to be comfortable in that split position. Because a lot of times I find with people that come on board later on with remote programming that can already, once again, kind of handstand where they've developed this habit of kicking up and closing their legs immediately. So they're either going to hit the handstand or they're going to tip over. And the problem with that is there's no in-between. If you're comfortable in that split position, you can save your handstand. Um, so that's been like huge for me, especially with a lot of my handstand pushup work, you know, cause there's a lot of variability as you're moving through that range of motion. So if I'm at the top of a rep and I'm going into another rep, if I almost lose my position, I can split my legs or, or I, or I can unconscious, unconsciously, subconsciously, I don't have to, yeah, I don't have to think about it. And I'm just moving my legs apart because I'm comfortable in that position and I can recalibrate because I've increased my base of support. So I think it's a really good tool to have just to not, when you want to work on, you know, whether it's press to handstand work, handstand pushup work, um, it's, it you're not wasting time with that balance component that we see with people that can kick up and they can either close their legs really quickly and have a handstand or it doesn't happen. Um, so the split kick up, I think that's huge and you can take that super far. And then the other one I like is toe poles, toe poles. Um, so that's, so this, this is going to be the opposite of heel pulls yeah. that, I, that I was bashing. <laughs> so we're chest to wall facing, um, but now we're not as close to the wall as like a chest to wall handstand. You know, you want to be maybe a foot away from the wall. Um, your feet are on the wall, so your hips are piked. And then all you're going to do is you're going to pull one foot off the wall and then slowly under control, you're going to pull the other foot off the wall. Um, it's kind of like a narrower split kick up sort of yeah more or less like there's a, there's a mini split in there at some point yeah it, you're absolutely right it's a mini split but what what it allows us to do is that first foot comes off the wall and then people can kind of slowly pull that second foot off the wall kind of at their own discretion you know as they're starting to pull it off you know where's my weight in my hands am i opening up my shoulders um and one of two things one of three things happens um, they, they pull that second foot off the wall and they actually hold a handstand, um, for at, at the start two, three seconds. And normally I like to program them for reps at first, but you'll, you'll either hold a handstand, you'll flop back. So your feet are on the wall or you'll go forward and you'll kind of come out of the handstand. Um, still, uh, hopefully no fatalities from this. Um, but there'll be a waiver at the end of this. We'll, yeah. <laughs> uh, link, we'll link in here just so everyone can sign just in case yeah, there's some disclaimer here at some point. Um, but yeah, and those toe poles just now let you start training the balance component. Whereas the split kick up was training the entry into the handstand, the toe poles get you into the handstand. So we've bypassed the, the entry. So now we can just start training the balance in and of itself. Um, when I start people out on it, I start them out with reps. I don't tell people to start holding. So I just have you, you know, pull your feet off the wall, then push your feet back onto the wall. That's one rep. So maybe you hung out there for a half to one second. Um, and typically I have people return to the wall by clawing their fingers into the ground um, to kind of have an active shoulder position. So the opposite of the heel pulls. Um, so honestly, chest to wall handstands, split kickups and toe pulls, those get people easily up to a 10 second handstand in my experience up to 30. Yeah. I love all those. Uh, and if you're feeling confident on those, I would say don't feel, and you've still got some strength at the end of a session. Don't be shy about trying to just kick up on your own. Um, even if you are just flopping all over the place, just kicking up in a freestanding environment, I think, I think builds confidence over time. So. Well, it builds uh, confidence because you can also start practicing 
I don't want to, uh, we could call it bailing, but we've been joking about this the entire yeah, time, but, but bailing out of a handstand is a skill in and of itself. Which way am I going to kind of dismount? Um, which way are my feet going to go? Cause you can rotate to the right. You can rotate to the left or, um, I sh shit you not. I actually had a few clients that choose to somersault out of a handstand when they bail, like go forward. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. That's style points right there. But you, bailing is a skill or being able to exit out of it is a skill and you should be comfortable with it too. Um, so it, it doesn't need to be that complicated. It's more about keeping it simple and being super consistent over time. Um, have you had a, a decent, what have you found as a success rate in terms of number uh, or times per week that you like to train it with people? Um, I think three to four. I, I love four if you've got the time, but at mm -hmm. least three I think is great great for reinforcing it and getting it a little faster um that that's what i that's what i see with the most success uh lots of people that get hooked on it they're always down to do it four times but at least three times i think is necessary what yeah. about what about you i think three to four is good too um and then the question we get a lot is where where would this show up in a program and we've touched upon different examples in other podcasts already um but like we already said in the beginning this is a this is a strength at first this isn't a skill like I remember um, I was so, because you're so inefficient at it at first, like you're not good at this, that it's, it's a lot of strength work. It's a lot of brute work. Um, I remember none of my Olympic lifting numbers or weightlifting numbers went down because I was, um, when I was spending so much time learning the handstand because it was so taxing strength wise. Um, whereas now, like if you and I were just train handstands and no upper body strength work, um, we'd probably lose strength because when we've become relatively efficient at the handstand that it's not that it's not strength work anymore. Um, it's more just, it's body awareness now. Yeah, it's, and just, it's, uh, it's balanced work. It'd be like us doing a juggling session or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but honestly, you could, you could put the handstand work um, with chin ups, you know, you could pair it with back squats. Um, there's really no rules. I would just put it. The only rule I would really follow is I'd put it in the beginning of a session when you're fresh. Um, because you just want to reinforce good habits. You don't want to be doing, you don't want to do like an entire upper body strength day and then try to do handstand work at the end. It's just, it's not going to work where you're, you're going to be, I guess we could say half-assing it. Yeah, I completely agree. And if you, if you are a crazy person and have the time, it can be a standalone session as, as oh, well. Uh, um, which that's what I did. And I've, but again, I'm a crazy person. So, uh, <laughs> but if you do, if you do have the time and easy access to an environment that allows you to train like that, um, doing it as its own session can be beneficial as well. Well, the beauty of it too is uh, maybe the beauty or not. I know a lot of countries are still, still in quarantine or lockdown. Oh, um, yeah. every, everything that we covered, you know, you can do at home. You don't need any equipment. Um, you just need a little space, not even a lot of space. Um, and it can go a long way. So if, this may be the time for people listening in other countries because I, I sent John the statistics the other day. We, we, we have a lot of listens in a bunch of other countries. So some of them probably are, are still in quarantine, unfortunately. Yeah. What's, what's up, Latvia? Um, <laughs> All right. I think that's I think, what it was. <laughs> I, I don't remember what country it was. Um, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. And it, it's, it's a good segue, too, because I think next week, John and I, might have figured out how to start scheduling guests for this so we're gonna have our inaugural guest who um can i would consider him an expert in handstands so we can definitely dive in for the more even for the beginner practitioner but for the more advanced uh, individual we can start talking um prerequisites to one arm handstand work you know we can talk stall to press press to handstand whether it's pike or straddle um and then we can even review stuff for the, the beginner as well. So I think he'll be a, a great resource. And hopefully we have him on next week. And John will be uh, catching more crabs by next weekend as well. Hopefully, yeah. That's the update people really want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, guys, go go learn a handstand. Put in that work early. Once you get decent at it, uh, you don't have to work on it quite as much. And it's a cool skill that will stay with you for. I mean, as long as you train it every now and then for quite a while. So uh, yeah. 
one of, one of the most fun things I've learned to do with my body, no doubt. So can't, can't uh, recommend working on it more. Yeah, I would, I would second that one. And I think that's a good place to end it. Cool. Well, until next week, guys. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is it? Rate, review, download, all that good stuff. Uh, share on your Instagram stories. We'll repost it. All that stuff helps. So if you guys are enjoying the podcast, uh, show us a little love that way. And, uh, and we will appreciate it. And we'll keep pumping out uh, good quality episodes. Did you watch like a, a video on podcasting? That was really good. Rate review. You had all these like. I think I copied what you said last time. So Did I just said that? it a little faster and more confidently. So you said it way more confidently. That yeah. was it. I listened. I, I listened to our last episode, and I was like, "I'm going to one up West this time." So I was like, I was like "Did he take a podcasting class?" No, it's good. <laughs> I like it. <laughs>